Welcome to the show. I'm excited to be here today. Shannon, thank you so much for being here, for sharing your expertise, your time, your story. I'm excited to chat. Yeah, same here, Charity. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So let's dive on in because I know everyone is dying to learn about not just like where you are now and what you're up to, but really where, what got you to where you are. So let's, let's dive in with your meant for more moment, that moment where it's like, oh, like, okay, what I'm doing is no longer working. I have to shift. I have to change something like I'm being called to level up and uh, like you took massive, crazy, imperfect action to get to the next level. So let's chat a little bit about one of your meant for more moments. I'd say one of them, I'd say that that kind of spiraled into multiple was I actually, and, and this isn't meant to be too sad, but I was literally with my dad on his deathbed. And he said, to me, when I asked him, I'm like, so what am I supposed to do? I was actually, didn't know he was on his deathbed at the time. I knew he was in the hospital, but we were talking about career work, stress, other things. And he was an accountant. And so am I, and I asked for some advice on careers. Like I'm unhappy. What do I do? And he just said to me, whatever the hell you want, Shan. And that was kind of a It's very simple, but earth shattering thing to hear, because up until that point, I had received guidance on literally everything to do in my career and in my life from him. So it was all the way from what college courses to take, to graduate with enough credits, when to sit for the CPA exam, what order to take the test in, what, uh, what type of work to do, what industry to go into was like, I had his advice all the time through my entire career for, you know, six, seven years. And I made manager at a big four firm and I was sitting there with him and he, I said, I'm just not feeling fulfilled. I don't know if I want to make partner. Like, what do I do now? And he goes, whatever you want, you, you did it. You did everything I asked you to do. And I didn't realize that there was a stop in that, that path that's paved. I walked the whole path with him. And then I stood in front of a ton of unpaved road. And he said, go whichever way you want to you're here. And it was very much overwhelming (laughs) to then be faced with those decisions. But I realized that, oh, I really am in control of what I want to do completely. I don't need to fall into a mold. I don't need to walk a carved out path. I can just do whatever I want to do and I'm okay. And that was kind of my first moment where I realized I was okay with the abstract of not knowing where I was going next. Hmm. I love this. There's so many really great nuggets in here. Um, as far as I think we could touch a little bit on like, even this, what you said, like the societal norm of like being guided our entire, like every step of the way of, okay, here's what you do. And you go to this school and then you go through, you know, K through 12, and then you go to college and then you go do, and then you do that. Right. Like the typical, like nine to five of every, like what, like the norm of everything of what everyone says we should be doing right compared to, okay, I did those. I followed those directions and I'm still not fulfilled or like what's next. And now I'm faced with this unpaved road. So maybe someone is experiencing that. Maybe they've taken all the steps. They've done all the things as they're listening to this. And they're like, Shannon, I'm there standing at the unpaved road. Like what is next? What the heck do I do? How do I move forward and begin to pave a road? What did you do in your story? And how can you encourage those people? So I had to learn Cause I'm, I'm, you know, I'm an Enneagram three to the nth degree. I oh, me to, too, girl. <laughs> I had to learn how to figure out what made me happy, not what I was good at. And the problem is for people like maybe, maybe both of us is I didn't know the difference between those two things. Cause being happy was being good at something. <laughs> mm. So just because you're good at it doesn't mean it makes you happy. Even if you feel satisfied and you feel productive and you feel these things, it's like, does it actually make you happy? And I was really good at what I was doing at work. I was, um, I was revered, I guess you could say for what I was able to do. And I was a high performer and I was successful, but on paper to every, metric and measurement you can think of. I was doing very well, but I was like, am I happy? No, because after my dad passed, I was traveling four or five days a week for this big four firm. And I was 
exhausted. And I said, I just want to go home and like have a community, have family. And I just discovered a whole new appreciation for the things that were not accomplishment driven that were actually making me happy and giving me more energy and actually rejuvenating my life and my feelings. So I just said, I need more balance, if you will. I hate the term work-life balance, but I needed to get back into a rhythm of doing things for me just because instead of for a purpose or for an achievement, accomplishment, or recognition, I wanted to make sure I was doing something that I actually wanted to do and examining that and actually taking a step back and saying what, uh, and I've since kind of bucketed this into three circles, which I call the way to find your purpose is what are you good at is circle one. What do you like to do is circle two. And then circle three is do other people need this from you? And that's actually the one people skip. <laughs> they do what they're good at and they like, but I'm like, but is there a market for it? Is it something that's needed? Will you serve a greater good by doing this? If you can find a combination of those three things, to me, that is your purpose. So I, w- I just got on a quest to find what am I supposed to be doing since I didn't have that rubric, if you will, to follow from my dad anymore. Hmm. That's so good. I love that. Those three circles. What are you good at? What do you like to do? And then uh, do others need it or are they willing to pay you for it? Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> right. I love that. So when it comes to, and I love what you said about, there's a difference between being happy, which it's not, doesn't always mean that that's like what you're good at is what will make you happy. Or I know for me, I've experienced the times where it was like, something that I was good at and I was happy with in the past no longer made me happy. And it began to like, feel like drudgery. And I began to like, hate it. Right. Like I, this was like how I transitioned out of my being a health expert and being a personal trainer. I just like started to just show up and be like, Ugh, like dread, <laughs> like not seeing the people because I loved my clients, but it was just like the daily of what I was doing and I um, just needed to change it. So, um, so what are you up to at now that you have kind of paved this path that you have found, right? Like you found what you were good at, you found what you like to do and you found what people are willing to pay you for. Right. What I actually unpacked was, and at the time when I was transitioning out of my, um, big four firm and into corporate was I realized I love to teach. It was a very long journey to figure this out, by the way, because I actually discovered a passion for fitness and I became a group fitness instructor. I came out of my shell. I kind of commanded a room. I had so much fun and I just absolutely love teaching. And I've been in fitness for eight years now. And it's so funny because I really got an outlet out of that and, and enjoyed it so, so much. It became part of my identity that I just loved this. And the funny thing is I realized that the connecting thread through everything I enjoyed in life is when I get to take on the role of a teacher. Yeah. And that was where I realized I need to serve in that strength, but most accounting firms, and I was good at accounting and I like it, but most accounting firms never approached anything from the heart of a teacher. It was always a commodity type of deliverable, like a tax return, or it was, you know, something a little bit more, I don't know, low touch. I feel like it wasn't really a customer service business. When I was working for different firms, I felt like we were all just kind of churning through the work, you know, sending it out. And there was just no, uh, relationship with the client beyond what we needed to get the work done. And I didn't like that. I said, there's a huge opportunity here to empower and teach people enough about this stuff. So they don't make these mistakes that we have to clean up and end up in this vicious cycle. So what if we just started with actually treating the problem, which is the fact that nobody understands this stuff and don't really want to learn it, to be honest. And, but at the same time, they need to know what not to do, but they need to be educated in a way that they will be engaged in. And I said, if there's anything else I can do, it's this, it's, it's actually adding that into the market. That's so good. And I love that what you said, like serving in your strengths and that you found that common thread. It was like, gosh, like every time I lit up, it was when I was doing like this 
common action. I was teaching it this, or I was teaching it that, or I was teaching it this. So I love that you said that. Like for me, it's when I follow the, the call to be a communicator. So when I am speaking or facilitating or the podcast or like writing, you know, like in my books or in my blogs or on social media, it's following the call to be a communicator, right? right. Maybe if you're listening for you guys, maybe it's hospitality. Like my mother-in-law, like she lights up, like when she is just like hosting people and hospitality, maybe it is, you know, some other thread that you can kind of look back at your life and find the common thread of no matter what industry you are in, no matter what room you are in this thing that I was doing, this theme that I was doing, um, lit me up. And if you can do that, then I think no matter what industry you're in, it's like, you're going to you're going to really thrive. So let's, let's kind of pivot into a little bit of what you were just talking about as far as like the common financial mistakes, like the, what not to do is like the typical things that people struggle with when it comes to their numbers. They're like, you are the numbers girl. I am not the numbers girl. (laughs) So let's just, I'm going to let you take this conversation away. Sure. So as far as examples of what that actually includes. Right. So I'll start with this. I didn't realize because I grew up in a, in a house where my dad was an accountant. Like I learned all this stuff when I was very young, kind of like you just learn stuff. I don't know where we learn certain things, certain habits, certain like common sense items. Right. But this became ingrained in part of my common sense. And it took me a while to realize that it was not common sense for other people. Mm -hmm. And that was, learning how to come from a place of like patience and grace with it was a process because I'm going, what do you mean you didn't learn this? And I, then I realized like, Oh, I, now I realize when I learned it because you don't remember when you learn certain things. Right. So I realized that we had to go back to the beginning. And one of the things that I realized about my entrepreneur clients is there's some real deep rooted fear around money and anything around the topic. So where we always start is looking it in the face and understanding that you have complete control and power over money. It's not a bigger concept. It's not this like evil element in your life or whatever you associate with it. Right. And I was realizing that there is a ton of folks out there. Maybe you're one of them, if you're listening, who receives maybe communications, letters from the IRS or anything that looks like it could relate to your finances. And you just kind of like keep that envelope closed and let it stack up on your desk and go, I'll deal with that later. And I'll tell you, that's the only way that is the only way to actually have it turn into a problem. And the irony is people are so afraid to open that because they're afraid they're in trouble, but what gets them in trouble is leaving it on the desk. Mm -hmm. And there's this constant cycle of irony of, well, if you open it, you won't be in trouble. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. It's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. <laughs> like, exactly. Oh, I'm going to get in trouble. I'm not going to open exactly. it. Exactly. So my number one thing is just like, stop avoiding it. And honestly, if you, if it's so trauma ridden where you're just like, I can't even open an envelope or I can't even look at my bank account balance. There's some other stuff to address there. Like there really is some other stuff to address there that we have to attack first, but you know, that at a minimum, you should not be avoiding your finances. This is something that is going to be so powerful. I mean, you worked in fitness, just like me. If you don't have your financials, it's like saying you don't have your calories in calories out your macros done, or your, even your, uh, history of what you've been able to lift or reps or, or weight and having your personal trainer, give you advice. It's like, I don't have any data. I don't know where you're at. I don't know where you want to go you know, that would be a conundrum for someone in that position. And it's the same with me and my clients. So having a good understanding of what, where do you want to go? Where are you now? And just being able to look at dead in the eye and say, this is where I'm at. This is where I want to be. Help me get there. Mm -hmm. I love that. And I love what you're saying where it's like, I feel like money, even the numbers is annoying as they are. I'm like, um, here's my real list coming out, right? Like as annoying as they are to look at for me, I actually really like what they tell me or the feedback that they get. Right. So whether it is like the numbers of like how many sales per day or what products come in or whatever it is, or what's in my bank account. And then, you know, shifting things into different savings accounts or whatever that might mean. Um, 
or even like now going into like lead gen or right, like how, like, I love what the numbers tell me as feedback. And so it's almost like going back to what we were saying with this self-fulfilling prophecy. If you don't open the envelope, if you don't open your bank account, right? Like you're not ever going to know what it's telling you, (laughs) like what is available to you or where to be able to go. So I love that. So what would you say like to have people say they are like afraid to open the envelope or they don't Mm -hmm. look at their bank account on a regular basis, what would you say to encourage them in this money journey? I mean, it, if you're listening to this podcast, right, we have this whole theme of meant for more. You're never going to achieve that more unless you really own the identity of the person that you want to be. And that person that you want to be, if it's financially successful, and if it's savvy with your money, you've got to own that. And you've got to take the steps necessary to get there. It's just, it, again, going back to fitness, you're not going to get a bikini competitor body unless you envision that you have a goal and you convert that into micro steps that will get you there on a plan towards that goal. But if you refuse, for example, you want to do a bikini competition, but you refuse to get on the scale or do any type of measurements. How do you know if you're on track? So my advice is, If you want to, if you want to get better with your money and be able to address it and look it in the eye, there is, there are folks who can help with that. And there's ways to approach it that work for you. And one of the things we do, and you know, if for my clients who work with me as their CFO is if they do have a struggle around that, I kind of turn it into something a little less dramatic or less stressful. I think if you start looking at it, you know, in pieces, or you start looking at certain metrics at a time is like, start with just looking at your bank account. What is that telling you learning how to read a profit and loss statement and what it's telling you? Like you said, you like what it tells you. Yeah. Most people don't know what these things tell them. They just see a bunch of numbers and get overwhelmed. So I think it's also just being able to translate a few key numbers into what does that mean for you? And then you actually start to look forward to seeing it because you know what you're going to gain from it for feedback. So that's going to be a big one is educating yourself on what does this actually mean for me and my business? That's so good. So I actually want to chat about what it looks like to, right? Like I think in the entrepreneurial world, we can be in this space of always learning how to do something when I don't know how to do it. So compared to now this, right? Like if we want to grow, if we want to level up when we're meant for more, we also have to learn the magic of outsourcing and hiring people or bringing people onto our team to do the things that take us out of our superpowers, that take us out of our magic, that take us out of the things that make us happy, the things that we like to do. So what would you say is that balance of, like knowing and learning your numbers and then find like bringing on someone that can also help interpret them for you so that you don't have to be. So it's like the person like myself who is, does not like the numbers, but I like what they tell me bringing on someone on your team or that you work with like yourself, like a CFO or an accountant or someone like that. What would you say is a good indicator for someone that they're ready for that? I would say if you're ready to get strategic about your money. So if you're thinking again, meant for more, right? So if you feel like your business is meant for more, if you're like, I want to grow and scale, I don't know how to do that. I don't know if I have the money for that. Or if the thought of hiring an actual full-time employee scares the living daylights out of you, we can help, (laughs) we can help kind of demystify that into a core set of this is when you're ready to hire an employee is if you make this much. And if this happens and it makes it way more digestible to understand these decisions, if we can give you metrics to reach, to say, these are when you're ready for these types of decisions. Now, when to hire a CFO, it is completely based on when you feel like you're just not getting enough out of what you're doing and you're ready for better decision-making using your numbers. Um, there are really layers to this though. So If you're just starting out, hire a bookkeeper. They're not that high cost. Hiring an accountant, people have a stigma that like we're crazy expensive. No, if you hire a CPA though, to do basic bookkeeping, you're probably going to be overpaying. What you should do is hire a bookkeeper, ideally one that works with a CPA. So you're getting, you know, quality 
work done from them and the two are speaking or they agree on things, right? So that you're not conflicting, but you want to have a bookkeeper there to manage the transaction flow, make sure everything's categorized properly and do the maintenance of the data. So make sure you have good data with a bookkeeper. Then you can layer on someone to analyze, interpret, and understand what these numbers are telling you, knowing that they're reliable. So that's the really important next step is once you've got the data into a flow, you want to add that additional layer of analysis and reporting so that you know if you're tracking towards your goals or not. And I would say also a really big indicator that you're ready to work with someone like me and we look for is how well can you define your goals in your business? Or if you need help with that, we can help with that. But if you come to me and say, Shannon, I want to be at this revenue level by this time next year. I love that because I'm like, okay, cool. That's our finish line. Let's work back from that. What do we have to do today to make that happen? That is my whole, I mean, our first guiding principle and core values is everything has to anchor to the goal of the client. Even if we want to use creative strategies and go, go off and have fun in your numbers and like do all these crazy other analytics that we love. Does that help the client reach their goal? And if it doesn't back burner for now, we have to focus on that first. And you really want to find someone who's in tune with your goals and isn't going to do too much to overwhelm you and kind of understands your rhythm. That's really important. So I would say you're really ready to hire a CFO. I mean, obviously when you can afford a monthly rate or quarterly rate, however they charge for their services. And they're generally going to be higher cost than your average bookkeeper. However, there's a return on investment there that's not necessarily tangible on day one, but everyone I've talked to a year later, they're like, thank God I hired you. But it's just not going to be felt. It's kind of like a trainer. You don't feel it in the first two workouts. It's like, no, but if you're consistent and we show up and we start learning how you work, we're going to see significant progress in not only tax savings, but your financial growth. And if you've got a team that's kind of always got you on their minds, it, it's a great combination. Mm, I love that. Speaking of tax savings, what, and this will actually, this will air <laughs> close to tax season, like going into the craziness of tax season. Yep. What are maybe some tips or things that you can share um, for people to either be aware of? And I know that, I mean, I even see on your Instagram, which you guys on go to Shannon's Instagram because she's super helpful um, in little things on even like hiring your kids, or I'm going to keep an eye on this next bill that Congress is trying to pass and what that could mean for you and for for your, you know, your write-offs or for your business or for your taxes. So I know that there are a lot of things up in the air right now because of different bills that are, yeah. <laughs> I'm just not even going to go on that tangent, but, um, what are some, maybe some basic tips as far as, um, going into tax season that would, that people would find beneficial? I mean, so number one is obviously have your books done. Um, that's going to be huge. And, uh, if you're currently wondering, you know, how am I going to do that right now? And I just have bank statements and everything. Yes, it's going to be stressful. I couldn't tell you how many clients called me in a pile of tears on their bedroom floor, surrounded by bank statements going, I don't want to never do this again. And you don't have to, hopefully you do that once in your life and that's it. <laughs> it's like, it's like a really bad night of drinking in college where you're like, I'm never doing this again. This is awful. <laughs> I'm never having the gold slogger again, <laughs> never doing this again. That was Jaeger bombs for me. I'm like, this is the Jaeger bomb of business. Like never do this again. It's a horrible idea. <laughs> um, don't do that to yourself. It's just going to stress you out. It doesn't have to be that way. You deserve better than that. So get your books in order. That's like the biggest thing. And if it's currently in 2022, um, you can still catch up. You can still do that, but, uh, that's going to be crucial. Then as far as taxes go, how to actually save money in taxes. I mean, there's so many different ways. And here's the thing I will say, um, TikTok is not necessarily a solid tax advice source, by the way. Uh, there's several people, this is actually really funny. There are several people who DM me the TikToks they find and they're like, is this real? 
<laughs> it's like, and it's like nine seconds of a tax tip, right? So understand that there are layers to these different tax strategies that you're going to see all over social media. I'll give you some. One is the Augusta rule, renting out your home for up to 14 days. You can also hire your kids for up to about $12,000 tax free. You can, um, you know, you can harvest your tax losses on your stock sales so that you can end up with a, a, a lower tax bill. There are so many things you can do to lower your taxes, but not every one of them makes sense for every person. And there's an iceberg here of you're going to see tax tips that people share, but there's this whole other below the surface with a set of if this and if this and if this and if this, that where it applies to you. Now they're not lying to you when they say these tax strategies are available, but there are a lot of conditions for it to make sense for you. So the best thing you can do is have someone in your corner who's there interpreting for you where you can send them. I don't mind this, by the way, my clients send me TikToks all the time saying, Hey, so-and-so said this, is this real? And I say, yes, but not for you. Um, or yes, but here's what you have to do to make that happen. And sometimes we have those really good conversations because they found research online. Um, but I would say that there's a ton of tax strategy that people are not tapping into that we really can use as business owners, especially as business owners, because the IRS wants to incentivize us to do certain things like hire people or to buy more equipment or purchase things at the end of the year to lower our tax bill. So really, if I had to encompass it into one big strategy, it's your goal as a business owner. And remember, this is kind of a mindset thing. Your business, your goal as a business owner is to maximize your business expense deductions because you're taxed on the profit after those expenses. So from a tax standpoint, you basically want to be at the lowest profit possible. What that does not mean is you actually want to be at the lowest profit possible possible. There's a difference between reality and tax return. Tax return wants to show the worst side of you, right? Everybody has a worst side, like right, left, right? They want to show the ugly side of your business because they want to showcase that you don't owe anything and that you have a very low taxable income, which is strategic. However, a lot of business owners connect their own sense of accomplishment and self-worth to the number on their tax return as their net income. And I had a conversation with a client about this recently where they were associating their actual, like I was a failure as a business owner this year because I had a loss. I go, no, you had a loss because you depreciated property. You took advantage of the home office. You took advantage of the Augusta rule and you did this, 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 this. And because of that, you could reimburse yourself. And all, a lot of this money became pre-tax. And then when we took that out, you ended up with a loss. This is a magical combination. This is what I live for is to see this result. I'm like, this is an A plus in my book, but yeah, they saw you got, a loss. You got paid. <laughs> yeah, you got paid. But they saw a loss on their books though and thought, you know, I got a D as an entrepreneur because I'm not making money. There's a very different interpretation of these numbers. And at what I fear are business owners not understanding what they're seeing or what lens that's coming from, what story that's trying to tell, and then taking that, internalizing it, and then reflecting that in their you know, self-image of themselves as a business owner. And I never thought I would have that problem. I would think like, oh, everyone wants to lower their taxable income. Not necessarily. A lot of people associate that with something different. Hmm, that's so good. So as we round out here, I know people are going to have tons of questions and want to come dive into your world. And I'm sure like, what about this? <laughs> like, what's the, um, what is the Instagram reel that's <laughs> popping oh, into God. my mind right now? It's the, uh, like this thing and you just write it off and you just write oh, the, it sh off. The, Schitt's Creek, you the Schitt's Creek audio. <laughs> If you guys haven't seen that episode of Shit's Creek, I live for that clip. I live for Eugene Levy going like, that's not a write-off. And I'm going, and I'll tell you every client, you guys, every client sent me that clip as soon as it aired. And they were like, oh my God, this is you. And this is me. 
I loved it. <laughs> it was so great. And who pays for that? I don't know. It's just the write-off people. Like <laughs> it's so exactly. funny. Exactly. So I love it. Well, you guys make sure that you, Shannon, um, let us know where they can find you. And you guys make sure that as you're listening to this, that you um, go find her on Instagram. She provides a ton of value. Um, and I know that people are just going to have questions for you and want to learn more about you. So where can people find you? The best place, as you mentioned, is on Instagram. Um, I'm at Shannon K Weinstein on Instagram, but now I'm tempted to to look at a handle, the write-off people. I want to be like at the write-off people. Um, if that's not already taken, sorry if it is, but, uh, no, I'm at Shannon K Weinstein on Instagram. You can find pretty much daily tax tips and stuff there. My blog is linked there, everything that's kind of my storefront. So check out everything I have there. Uh, and you can also text me if you have questions. So if you have questions from the episode or just want to chat privately, uh, you can text me and my number is 860- 609-6374. And yes, it's me. It's nobody else. It's actually me. And you can ask questions on there as well. And I'm happy to, to chat more. So awesome. And you also have a podcast. Yes, I do. I have a podcast called keep what you earn and, uh, absolutely loving the podcast life. Uh, and it's, we've had such some amazing guests on that show talking more about money, money, mindset, business strategy, how to save money in taxes. You're going to get a ton of value out of that. Awesome. You guys will make sure to dive in. I'll have everything in the show notes as well. Shannon, thank you so much for being here. It's always so great to connect with you and looking forward to not only diving more into your podcast, um, but really sharing what you do with other people because yes, in their journey for being meant for more, knowing what their money is telling them and how to be able to use it as a tool. I like, even as our coach, uh, Chris Harder, even as he says, when good people make great money, they are good people make good money. They can do great things. And that's what this really is all about. So Shannon, thank Absolutely. you for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to the show. I hope it brought some value and some fun into your business and life. Remember to rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast and even share the episode with a fellow business bestie who you know will love it. It helps us continue to attract top level guests and reach more and more women who are on their journey in business just like you. Remember that when money gets in the hands of good women, great things happen. Cheers to your success.